Hey team, chemistry coach coming at you in video number six in our journey of the atom. Here we go. We are looking at atomic mass, which we've mentioned before. We were looking at mass number, atomic number, and I made a comment. We were looking at isotopes that the mass number, which is the number of nucleons, number of particles in the nucleus, protons plus neutrons, which is almost the entire mass of the particular atom to start with, right? Because an electron you know, takes like 1,800 something electrons to equal the mass of one proton or one neutron. So you can pretty much ignore the electrons. So you'd think that the mass number was the same as the atomic mass. No, 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 no. They're close, but not quite. So atomic mass is a lot more difficult than you would think because of the presence of isotopes. Remember, an element contains atoms of different masses because they have different numbers of neutrons, those isotopes. John Dalton didn't know about that at the time when he did his atomic theory. So if there weren't isotopes, this would be a lot easier, <laughs> okay? Since we have different atoms, if we take, you know, say we take 100 atoms of, you know, iron or something, they're not all going to be the same, right? Some will have one mass, all the isotopes of this type will have this mass, all the isotopes of this type will have a different mass. So we cannot just do a simple average. And what, what the bummer is, they don't come in equal percentages, right? So if I have a sample, say carbon, you know, I've got carbon 12, carbon 13, carbon 14. Well, it's not an, an equal amount, right? It's like 90 something percent carbon 12, a couple percent carbon 13. So we can't just add them together and do a, an average, right? Add all the isotopes together and divide by three if there's three of them. Wouldn't that be nice? So we can't do a standard average. We have to do what's called a statistically weighted average. No, statistics come to haunt us again. I highly recommend you take a statistics class. Very useful. A speech class would be good too. So we have to do a statistically weighted average. So this is what that looks like. The average atomic mass, which usually we'll just say that's a statistically weighted mass over all of its known isotopes, blah, blah, blah. That is the sum, see the summation sign, of the fractional abundance. You can think of that as percent. We'll be able to convert from fractional abundance to percent, like a fraction to a percent pretty easily, of each known isotope. Right, And each known isotope has a specific mass called an isotopic mass. So isotope number one is this mass, and there's, say, 25% of that one. And isotope number two has a different mass, and then say there's 50% of that one. And isotope number three has this mass, and there's 25% of that one. But there's half of it's this mass, and a quarter's this mass, and a quarter's this mass. So what we do is if we have three isotopes, for example, we have three terms. Take the fractional abundance times the isotopic mass of isotope number one plus... The fractional abundance times the isotopic mass of isotope 2 plus, so the summation, the isotopic mass times the fractional abundance of isotope number 3. And that gives you the average weighted atomic mass. That will give you the number here on the periodic table. Those are all statistically weighted average atomic masses over all known isotopes. So notice carbon is 12.011. These are not exact numbers like mass numbers, right? You can't, you can't, a mass number is a number of particles. An atomic mass is, is a, a, an experimentally determined thing. Now, we're going to have to take a little segue here and go, well, what is the fractional abundance and how do we get that? And what is the isotopic mass and how do we get that? Once we have them, you just plug them into the math. The math is tedious, but not hard. So calculating, it's easy. But I will give you these. I'm not going to make you determine what these are. I'll provide you those. But I do want you to know where they come from. So let's look at isotopic masses first. How do we get them? What are they? And then fractional abundances and percentages after that using the dreaded mass spectrometer. Ooh. All right, what is this dreaded isotopic mass a deal? I mean, imagine trying to weigh one atom. Yeah, good luck with that one. <laughs> it gets a little crazy. So wouldn't it be nice if we could just, you know, calculate it? It'd be great. You would think if we took an isotope, we could just take the number of neutrons plus the, the mass, you know, so we know the mass of a neutron. We just add, take the number of neutrons times it, the mass of a neutron 
plus the number of protons times the mass of a proton plus the number of electrons times the mass of the electron. Add them all together. That should be the mass of a particular atom of an isotope. Right? Wrong. That's not how it works, unfortunately, because of something called nuclear binding energy. When you take the individual subatomic particles by themselves and combine them, there's a slight change. There's a loss of energy. It goes to a lower energy state. And that energy is, is released, which decreases the mass of it overall. So the mass of the atom the, of a specific isotope is not equal to the mass of the individual subatomic particles added together. That darn nuclear binding energy, what can you do? So that means we have to experimentally measure it. And the wonderful mass spectrometer, you may or may not use those in the undergraduate experience. But if you go to graduate school or become a chemistry major, maybe your senior uh, level or something, you'll probably use mass spectrometers. Wonderfully cool uh, devices. Um, I have a video made when I was doing some lectures over at UCI on a quadrupole. There's different types of mass spectrometers, but I was talking about how a quadrupole mass spectrometer works. Not, not for you know, somebody who just wants to go watch a movie or something. I mean, that's, a, that's a tough topic. So if you want to have a mind bender, you can go watch those videos to get more details. I'm just going to give you a really quick overview. Um, we just want to know how to use that calculation from the prior board, right? But let me show you kind of how they come about. So on the next board, we'll talk about mass spectrometer. The problem is because there's uh, one atom is so tiny and light, we can't just stick it on a balance pan and say, yay, there's its mass. What we're going to do with these mass spectrometers is kind of like have a foot race between two different atoms and send them into the foot race. I'm an, I'm an old sprinter. I right? did the 100, 200 meters, 400 meters, 4x4, four 4x1, four, four a little bit of long jump. Tried the high jump. Not so successful. But when I ran the 200 meter dash, you, you start with a, uh, a curve. You start on a curve and you curve and then go to a straightaway. So you're like, wow, foom. Well, I was always the smallest runner. Always. And I was able to come out of the blocks faster, and I could just hug that corner real tight. I'd be like, blah, 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 dancing on that. There's pictures of me. I'm just dancing on the line going, wee! And stronger, bigger, bulkier people can't take the turn as well. It's like a Titanic versus a speedboat. I was a speedboat running against these big, hurricane guys. I was probably 130-something pounds in high school and early college, running against people, you know, 180, 190, some of them a 200. Let me see, so strong. But I would just rip these people coming around the corner, and of course, well, they'd pass me in the straightaway. I'm like, <laughs> that's the way it is. But we can take advantage of the fact that lighter particles turn corners faster than heavier particles. We can separate them out. And it's essentially what a mass spectrometer is going to do. We can put a whole bunch of atoms of different masses into a mass spectrometer and separate them out in space or time. And from that, we can measure percentages of each one. Uh, that's how we're going to get fractional abundance. Um, and we can get the mass ratios of them. I could get the mass of this one divided by the mass of that one. Um, so what we're going to do because of that, if we want absolute isotopic masses, a specific mass, we're going to define, we need a, a reference point that's defined. And there's been some changes over the years, right? Do we use hydrogen, you know, you know, this isotope of hydrogen and define it? Do we use this isotope of oxygen? Do we use this isotope of carbon? What do we use as a defined reference state? You're going to see this all throughout chemistry where we have a defined reference state for this and a defined reference state for that. So everything compared to that would be this value. So the finally, I think it, was, it took until like 1970 or 71, don't quote me on the date, to where the entire global scientific community finally agreed on a reference point of carbon and of carbon, specifically the carbon-12 isotope, that specific one, which is the most common one in there. So they chose and defined, if I had one atom of that isotope of carbon, carbon-12, it has a mass exactly equal to 12, well, nice number, we can pick any number we want, 12 atomic mass units, which has that symbol, the mu symbol, or DA for Dalton, right, in honor of John Dalton. Why don't we use grams? Well, an atom's pretty light, right? <laughs> you can't just put one on a balance, you're not going to notice it. So we have a different unit of mass for individual atoms, isotopes, and molecules. So one atomic mass unit, or Dalton, is 1.6605, five sig figs is good enough, 1.6605 times 10 to the minus 24th gram. So an AMU is really light, really tiny. 
So 12 atomic mass units. That's defined as the mass of a single atom of the carbon-12 isotope. So what we're going to do is take a mass spectrometer and have a foot race between that, theoretically, right, between that specific atom that we know because we defined it, and any other atom of any other isotope, and we can measure the ratio of those. Well, if we know the ratio of those and we know the, ab the mass of one of them, we can calculate the isotopic mass of the other isotope that we don't know. And we can do that for all the known isotopes. And there's tables of those things. So let me show you briefly how we do it. This is how we do it. Here is a really, really overly simplistic view <laughs> of one type of mass spectrometer. This is not a quadrupole one, so if you want some more gory details, uh, you know, check out my videos on YouTube uh, that I did over at UCI. Um, but let's take this one where we've got this, this curved cavity, right? And we can send atoms in there. And what we do is we charge them, and we use a combination of electric and magnetic fields, right? A charged species curves in, electric, in a magnetic field, right? So what we do is we, you know, I'm not going to go through the details, we take our sample, get the atoms into the gas phase and get them charged, right? So they're actually ions at the time. So we charge them. That means we can move them, correct? And what we do is we move them and a mag the magnet causes them to turn. We talked about the Titanic versus the speedboat. The lighter one's more like a speedboat. The heavier one's more like the Titanic, right? Like me running the 200 meter dash blah, 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 versus this big, you know, real strong guy. I was not a really big strong guy. I was just quick. So we shoot these, uh, these particles, these charged particles in the gas phase and put them in a foot race in a mass spectrometer. Whoop, the magnetic field bends them. And so, so say we take, we don't know copper 63. We want to know the isotopic mass of copper 63. We know carbon 12 because we defined it as 12 atomic mass units. So we send them in there and boom, the carbon 12 atoms hit here, the copper 63 atoms hit here. We know the distance between those. Magic math happens, we can get the mass ratio. <laughs> this is not our purpose of this particular talk, but you can go look into this more if it intrigues you. So we can measure the mass ratio of this one to that one. And let's say our mass spectrometer gives us a value of 5.2442 of the copper 63 uh, uh, atom over the carbon 12 atom. Well, Given the fact that we know carbon-12 is 12 atomic mass units and we know the mass ratio, can't we solve for the isotopic mass of copper-63? Do it for me. I'll pause it and see what you get. Hopefully you got what I got, right? Pretty simple math, right? We know this one, we know that one. So just multiply 5.2442 times the defined value for carbon-12. See, well, we got to define that one. So the isotopic mass of a copper 63 isotope would be 62.93040. Since that's exact, we're limited to the five significant figures, which would be based on whatever mass spectrometer you're using. So we get 62.930 atomic mass units or Daltons. That's where we get those numbers from. Now, fractional abundance, uh, we can also get that from, I always provide those for you, but we can use a mass spectrometer to do that as well. So what I'm going to do is pause it, erase this board, and take this exact same mass spectrometer, but what we're going to do is take a sample of an element with a certain number of atoms in it, right? And a certain percentage of those atoms will be isotope number one, a certain percentage of those atoms will be isotope number two, et cetera, et cetera. We'll send them through the foot race. Well, won't the lightest isotopes hit here, and then the next heaviest, next heaviest? So we can separate the individual isotopes out in space here, and measure how many of those atoms. So say we shot 100 atoms in there. Well, if 10 of those atoms hit here, that would be 10% of the sample. If five hit here, that'd be 5% of the sample. You see how that works out? So let's draw that out real quick, and then we can do some calculations on average, statistically weighted average atomic masses. Oh! Let's walk through this board. So we got the same mass spectrometer, but in this case, we're not doing isotopes of different elements. Right? We're having a foot race between the different isotopes of a specific element. So let's take a fictitious element, you know, loxium, ha <laughs> ha named after me. And let's say we're theoretically able to shoot 100 atoms of loxium in there. And loxium has three different isotopes. And I'm trying to figure out, well, what percent? Are they, are they equal? Are, is there five of one and 12 of the other and 80 something? Other? How do I know? Well, let's shoot, let's get them in the gas phase and ionize them. Boom. 
Put them in a foot race. Boom, let's say isotope number one is the lightest one and hits there after it curves in the magnetic field. Isotope number two is the middle range one, hits there, and isotope number three, which is the heaviest, boom, hits way over there. Okay. Well, what I can do is have a detector here that measures the number of atoms that strike at that specific mass. So I can create what's called a mass spectrum from the mass spectrometer. That's like a computer readout you'll get. So what it does is it plots the number of atoms that hit based on the mass to charge ratio. From that we can get the mass. So let's say 33 atoms of isotope number one strike at this whatever mass is. 51 of the second isotope hit here and only 16 of the third isotope hit here. You can see the height of the bars, right? And that's why I picked 100 atoms fictitiously because if 33 atoms hit, 33 out of 100 would be 33%, 51%, 16%. The total must equal 100%, right? Well, that tells me the percent breakdown of the number of uh, isotopes of a specific uh, element. Mm -hmm. What we're going to need for our calculations to get the average statistically weighted uh, mass of an atom of a specific element, averaged over all its isotopes, is we need the fractional abundance. Right? Typically, we're given the percent. Well, all the fractional abundance is is that percent divided by 100. So the fractional abundance of isotope 1 would be 0.33. This would be 0.51, this would be 0.16. You're just converting a, a percentage into a fraction, you know, dividing by 100. No big deal. You already know how to do that. So if I give you the percentages or the fractional abundance, and I give you the individual isotopic masses that we would have got, you know, experimentally for mass spectrometers, we should be able to calculate the average atomic mass of an element weighted over, statistically over its isotopes, and that's these numbers right there. That's the answer we should get given the limits of the mass spectrometer you have at the time. So we should get pretty close to those numbers. Let's do some of those calculations. So just an introduction to mass spectrometers and how we get isotopic masses and fractional abundances. Moving on. Here is, there's two ways we can ask you these kinds of problems. This is way number one, and then the other one is where we're trying to figure out, uh, you know, maybe the isotopic mass of a specific atom or a fractional abundance. But this one, we're calculating the average atomic mass, and we should get this answer on the periodic table. And this is for silicon, so what's the average atomic mass of silicon? So we should end up with an answer pretty close to 20, what is that, 28.0855, right, atomic mass units. So we know, kind of know what the answer is ahead of time. We should get pretty close to that. Depends on the uh, uncertainty that we track here. So given the following information, it has three isotopes. The first one, silicon 28, 92.23% of it. If we did that mass spectrometer, that'd be a really big bar on that one. Um, so if we had 100 atoms, you know, a little over 92 would be that. And that has an isotopic mass of 27.97693 atomic mass units or Daltons. Right? Uh, the second isotope, silicon 29, there's 4.67% of it, so not that many. And that has an isotopic mass measured with a mass spectrometer relative to carbon-12. Remember, these are all relative to carbon-12. You change the defined rel uh, uh, reference state, you change all the numbers. That is 28.97649 atomic mass units. And then the rest is the third isotope, which is silicon-30. So we have silicon-28, silicon-29, silicon-30. So you can figure out the number of neutrons each one has. Um, that has an atomic uh, uh, isotopic mass of 29.97376 atomic mass units. Notice I did not give you the percent of the third isotope. Well, we could figure that out, right? Because if we add all three, that should equal 100%. So first thing we need to do is figure out the percent of silicon-30. Right? So the percent of isotope sil silicon-30 should be 100 minus the other two. So that be, should be 100% minus the percent of silicon 28, minus the percent of silicon 29. Now, sometimes you'll be given the third percent, but you don't need it because you can always figure it out by subtracting from 100. So let's pop this in there. And that 100's exact, by the way, as defined. What's the silicon 28? 92.23%. What's silicon 29? 4.67%. That's exact, two decimals, two decimals, so our answer will be two decimals, and I get 3.10%.
So that is the percent of silicon 30. So now we have the percents of each one, which we're all going to divide by 100 to get to the fractional abundance. I'll do that in the math. Uh, and then we have all the isotopic masses. So we should be able to calculate the statistically weighted average atomic mass of silicon from this. Obviously, I don't have room, so I'll erase the board. See if you can jump on it ahead of time. Take that, that uh, equation I gave you, remember? Um, so the average mass, I'll write this again on the next board, is the sum of the fractional abundance of each isotope times the isotopic mass of each isotope. So you do this for, so take that for silicon 28, plus that for silicon 29, plus that for silicon 30, and you're good to go track your uncertainty. Not hard, but we got to track uncertainty. Welcome to science. Well, chemistry specifically. So jump on it ahead of time. If you're feeling adventurous, I'll pause the board and write it on up and we'll go through it together. All right, not hard math, but tedious. Right, we got to track uncertainty in units and all that fun stuff. So here's our equation again for the statistically weighted average atomic mass of silica. It's the sum of the fractional abundance times the isotopic mass of all known isotopes. And we have three of them. So we're going to have three terms. So here's the first term for silicon 28 times the fractional abundance times its isotopic mass, which I gave you both, plus the silicon 29, multiply those two factors, plus the silicon 30, right? We got the summation sign. That's a statistically weighted atomic mass. You don't, you don't just add the three atomic masses and divide by three. That would only be true if it was exactly one third of each isotope, which is not the case. So we cannot do a basic, a, a typical average. All right. Well, fractional abundance is the percent divided by 100, right? So let's take the percent of silicon 28, which I gave you, 92.23%. Divide that by 100. That's the fractional abundance of silicon 28. Times the isotopic mass I gave you of 27.97693 atomic mass units. Plus, let's take the percent of silicon 29, which is 4.67. Divide that by 100 to make it a fractional abundance times the isotop, op, blah, 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 isotopic mass given to you, 28.97649 atomic mass units, plus the percentage of the silicon 30, which we had to calculate, 3.10%, divide that by 100 to get a fractional abundance, times its isotopic mass, 29.97376 atomic mass units. Pretty straightforward. Now we've got to do this in two steps because notice we've got multiplications, divisions where we're limited by the fewest significant digits and we've got additions where we're limited by the largest absolute uncertainty which is similar to the fewest number of decimal places. So let's do all the terms in brackets with all the multiplication division. The hundreds are exact but here we're limited to the four sig figs here, three sig figs there, three sig figs there. So the percentages we got really limit our significant digits. It would have been nice to get more significant digits to match the isotopic masses, but it is what it is. So if I take 92.23 divided by 100 times the isotopic mass of silicon 28, I get 25.8031 atomic mass units, good to four significant digits. Do the same thing for silicon 29. Right, take its fractional abundance times its isotopic mass, I get 1.3532 atomic mass units, limited to the three significant figures from the percentage. Take the same thing for silicon 30, take the 3.10 over 100 times the isotopic mass of silicon 30, I get 0 0.92918 atomic mass units, also good to three significant figures. Now notice, the biggest contribution to the mass is the first isotope, because there's like not, over 90% of it, even though it's the lightest one, more than 9 out of 10 atoms of silicon are the silicon 28. So it's going to have the most weight or impact on the overall average mass, which is huge. So out of its total mass, it's got 25.8031 versus like the heaviest one, which is only 3.1%, only factors in 0.92918. So it's a very small contribution, but it's a contribution nonetheless. That's called a statistically weighted average. Well, that's good to two decimals, two decimals, three decimals. Fused is two, so our final answer is limited to two decimal places. So let's take the 25.8031 plus the 1.3532 plus the 0.92918. I get 28.0854 atomic mass units. Good to two decimal places. Well, that's a little closer to 28.09, so it rounds up to 28.09. Limited by the sig figs. And if you look again at the value on the periodic table for silicon, it depends on the, the periodic table you have. 28.0855 right there. 28.0855, 28.0854. 
you know, that's within one in the second non-significant digit. That's pretty darn close. Sweet. So that's where all these numbers come from, gang. All these numbers on here were calculated this way. Now, the second type, and you need to practice homework and problems with that. I'm unlikely to give you a problem like this on a quiz or test because the answer's on the periodic table. The answer's right there. You know the answer ahead of time. And I don't want you to just write the answer and not show any work. But I got it right, professor. I'm like, oh, the point is to do the, the, the problem. So what you'll see on my exams is we know the average mass, right? That's the number here. You already know the answer. The atomic masses are on here. So what if I did the same problem and I gave you everything except the average isotope, not the average, the isotopic mass of silicon 30. Let's say we didn't know that. So you would just call this X. And you would insert the answer, the 28.0855 here. So you go 28.0855 equals this term plus this term plus that times X. And then you just solve for X. Or I could give you all the isotopic masses and maybe I didn't give you the percent uh, well, that'd be too easy to do, right? I didn't give you the percents of two of them or something like that or one of them. You can solve for any one of these as long as you know everything except that one. Just remember what trips students up is they forget that the answer is on the periodic table. That's the average atomic mass. And then you have all the fractional abundance in isotopic mass terms. So expect that on the exams. It's just the same type of mathematics, just solve for X. Most commonly, you'll solve for one of the isotopic masses. All right? So that was some heavy stuff. If you're bored on a Saturday morning, got nothing to do, check out my quadrupole mass spectrometer videos uh, posted on YouTube. Just type in my name there, uh, and you can get a much more detailed uh, explanation of how some of those work. This was a different type of mass spectrometer. There's lots of cool ones. Maldi, I mean, you could go on and on. Some people spend their whole lives just on mass spectrometers. Pretty cool stuff. You guys rock.